Thanks everybody for coming. Come on in and grab a seat. Uh, today we're talking about uh, what does it take? What did it take for Verizon to deploy Cloud Foundry, manage Cloud Foundry, and make Cloud Foundry a success uh, for Verizon? First, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a, a DevOps and cloud architect at Verizon. I got my start in the cloud with OpenStack at Verizon and then went on to actually deploy, launch, and, and manage Cloud Foundry for the last couple of years at Verizon before finally moving on and into some uh, API first transformation. Uh, feel free to reach out and connect on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. Best way to get a hold of me. Enough about me. Let's talk about Verizon. Verizon is big. 170,000 employees, 10,000 IT developers, 3,000 IT systems. Verizon is big. It's a Fortune 15 enterprise. When you think of Verizon, what do you think of? Who? Who's? Cell phones, right? Who's, who's got a Verizon phone? Awesome. Uh, everybody else? Ugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but Verizon isn't just cell phones. Um, if you came over from the East Coast, you might know our fiber-based home broadband and TV product. Uh, don't tell the guys next door over the Comcast presentation, but it's pretty good. Hmm? <laughs> but Verizon is not just broadband and cell phones. It's not just the telco. It's all of these. Verizon is our enterprise solutions, it's our IoT space with ThingSpace, it is our um, mobile first digital video platform Go90, it's our media and advertising digital properties with Yahoo and AOL combined into Oath. Verizon is so many different things, but Verizon is changing. Verizon is becoming a software company. Our move into 5G is exponentially growing the amount of network throughput and data that we need to handle. All the new services that we're looking to get into are higher up on the network stack than are higher up on the stack than the network. So that's managing numerous massive mesh of connected devices to build out a smart cities platform. That's adding connectivity to your car through our telematics plugin, Hum. Verizon is moving into all of these new markets, and all those new markets are software. Verizon is becoming a software company. And in order to be competitive in the marketplace as a software company, we have to deliver software faster to the, to the market. And Cloud Foundry is one of the ways that we deliver that software faster. That all sounds pretty good. In reality, in practice, not that rosy of a picture. We've been on a long journey with Cloud Foundry. Right? And that journey has had its challenges and pitfalls, and it's had our learnings along the way. So what I really want to talk about is our journey and what we've learned along the way that you can leverage in your own business. So let's start with our journey. We started back in 2015 with five applications and our first private cloud automation launch based on OpenStack as the IaaS layer, and then Cloud Foundry is the platform on top of it for PaaS functionality as well. We started to grow that. We learned from the use cases. Later, we extended to multiple more data centers and leveraged VMware as an underlying more stable footprint, and saw that as our way to expand our private internal data center footprint. Then we started moving into public cloud space with AWS. Now, Fast forward to 2017, and we're fully getting off of OpenStack, and we're doubling down on our public cloud investment through AWS. So today, we're running in six data centers, including AWS. We have 12 foundations, which I think is really a, one of the unique things about our, app, our Cloud Foundry deployment, is just the number of foundations that we're running. We're supporting 100 applications and running over 4,000 containers at any point in time. Pretty big scale. Why do we go on this journey with Cloud Foundry? First and foremost, to reduce the time to business value. 
Everything we do to, in, to digitally transform and change the way we write software is all about reducing the time to business value and being be more effective at delivering that software. We do that by letting developers focus on developing. Do what we pay them to do, which is to write code that ends up as part of the app in production. Anything else is a waste. Along the way, we found, and you've seen a lot of the discussion here today around multi-cloud strategy, we stumbled upon the benefits of that as we were looking for migration paths from private to public cloud. The like-for-like -like environments of Cloud Foundry provide an easy path for that migration to public cloud. And the same applies to go from one public cloud to two public clouds. And then finally, the least tangible benefit of why Cloud Foundry is when you have that rapid acceleration, that rapid decrease in time it takes to get an idea and put it out in front of the business, you drive an innovation culture. You drive a culture where it's okay to try out an idea, test it on its own merits, and then feel free to continue or move in a complete other direction because the amount of investment to make that push to put that idea out in front of the business becomes significantly less on Cloud Foundry. So let's talk about what makes Cloud Foundry successful at Verizon. At the end of the day, adoption and growth of the platform is only successful if the developer experience is phenomenal. It doesn't matter how stable, how performant, how well over-engineered with every piece of technology you can imagine under the hood. If the developers think it sucks, it sucks. And when we talk about who our developers are, when we started, we all thought we were going to have these 12 out of 12 factor greenfield complete from the ground up re-architecture applications. The best of the best unicorns. Um, in reality, what we got, a little different. <laughs> right? But that's okay. When we look at our actual use cases on the scale of brownfield to greenfield, um, I think we find that we're somewhere in the middle, maybe skewing a little bit towards greenfield, but those are, they become some semi-stateless, uh, maybe they're not a couple factors short of 12-factor um, applications that are in the, still in the middle of refactoring. Or they're, they're small, single-purpose built applications. They're not massive systems that now have been completely re-architected. So realizing just that not every application is going to be greenfield, and that, that, was, that took a while for us to really recognize just how true that was going to be for application re-architecture, that that's okay. We can't hold out for perfect use cases if we want to grow adoption. So this actually then, knowing that we have not so perfect 12-factor applications coming in, and we have developers who are, this is a brand new concept to them, this re-architecture is scary. There's benefits of an opinionated PaaS. There's benefits of Cloud Foundry here, right? Opinionated PaaS kind of become those bumpers in the bowling lane that you can move around, but you're still gonna stay within the lane of what you're able to do within the platform. And so these are things like maximum container sizes. I can't push a container that's 32 gig. You can try, but we won't let you. You can't SSH in. You have a limited selection of build packs to choose from. You're forced to be multi-tenant. That platform is gonna be inherently a little less stable, so you have to start accounting for that within the architecture of your application. These are things that, really, the, the equivalent of, of pushing a kid into the deep end of the pool when it came to adoption of the platform. Bring the developers on, lure them in with promises of faster deployment, and then they get hit hard with the hammer of the reality of why 12-factor is really needed. In order to provide a ex ex superior developer experience, especially as developers are uh, transforming the way they're writing software and they're transforming their application architectures, as an operations team, as a platform provider, we really need to do everything in our power to empower those developers. That was something that is a continual lesson that we learn, is how, just how critical it is 
to not just invest in the platform, but invest in ways to empower developers who are using the platform. So we do that by now enabling troubleshooting with self-service tooling, uh, network ver uh, connectivity applications, uh, dummy shells that they can SSH into to, to perform platform level checks. And we do that by being transparent, taking the, the, you know, these DevOps practices or DevOps principles of breaking down that silo and providing feedback and every step of the process from the operations side back to development. And being honest about what a cloud is, what is to be expected from multi-tenancy and stability, um, and helping applications really distinguish the, the ever asked question of a platform operator, something's kind of funny with my app, something's not working right. Is it my app or is it the platform? Providing all the tooling we can to help troubleshoot that issue, help developers self-service troubleshoot that issue. So that's providing the developer experience. That's what we can help to provide to make that experience better. That said, a superior developer experience still requires a performant and an available and stable platform. So that gets us into how do we operate Cloud Foundry? How do we keep Cloud Foundry running at massive scale? How do we keep 12 Cloud Foundries running at large scale? To do that, you need a top-notch team. Your operations team becomes subject matter experts, not just in all the technologies that make up the platform, but every technology that that platform touches, because they become the front door for support um, for anything associated with that platform. So that is, if you integrate into an identity system, your platform operators need to know the ins and outs of that identity system. I, I think honestly within Verizon, within IT, that our Cloud Foundry operations team was the first instance of a true full stack engineering team. And that's because operations owns the whole stack. From the, bare, the base level infrastructure, all the way up through to elastic runtime, and then all the way up to the network services and any other services that Cloud Foundry plugs into, support and ownership applies across the entire stack, even to the point of operators creating applications that they in turn themselves run on Cloud Foundry and are available as tools available um, to consuming developers. Cloud Foundry operations owns that whole stack, and so you need a top-notch team with, with subject matter expertise in that full stack. Expertise in the stack is one thing. The other thing you need to manage is visibility. You need a situational awareness of what is going on in your foundation, in your platform, at any point in time. And so you need, in my opinion, a, a good quality monitoring suite to do APM and infrastructure monitoring of a Cloud Foundry foundation. And we've done this with integrations into Datadog. Getting all those metrics, pushing them with the Datadog, what, is it, what really matters from those measurements? We really measure four things that are important to us. We measure health KPIs of each foundation. Our jobs responding, our VMs up. We measure capacity remaining. When do we need to start scaling out this platform? Can someone come in and schedule additional containers or are we gonna run out of space? That we need to know in advance. Underlying VM health as an indicator, is, is there something going on with the IaaS that we need to be aware of that we could be in a, running in a more fragile state at this point in time? And the last one, which I'm, I'm really excited of our progress on, is smoke tests. Being able to run continual smoke tests against each foundation. Every 15 minutes we run the smoke test errand against every foundation and feed those results back into monitoring. What does that look like in the end? Taking all those foundational health KPIs and putting them on the one screen, that's our sea of green. That is our one quick look at what is the health of our foundations? What are the health of all 12 of our foundations? And what, what actions do we need to start taking? Then we start to dive into what's happening within each foundation and charting that out over time, seeing What's capacity remaining? Was there a spike in uh, 500 requests over time? 
When are, when are our peak load periods? All things that we want to track and measure and monitor. That's visibility. Operations needs visibility and they need action from that visibility. And that's where we've seen great success in these last couple months with Concourse. Concourse has been a game changer for us. We use it now to do um, release upgrades to keep us actually closer to the latest version released upstream of Cloud Foundry. We use it to do stem cell upgrades. We use it to do build pack management. That's the mechanism of which we're able to do that every 15 minutes uh, continual smoke testing and pushing those out to, uh, up to Datadog. And we even use it for centralized user management, managing users in one location and propagating that change out to 12 foundations, which has enabled us to do smaller, more frequent pack patching. Um, so it allows us to be quicker in operating the environment, but it also promotes uh, consistency across all the environments. Before Concourse, we had trouble keeping all of our environments consistent. And that led to a poor developer experience. If their app pushed in one environment but failed the stage in another because the Java build pack was different, that's a poor developer experience. And that's something that would slip through the cracks before we brought in Concourse. Now, while I was on the plane here, I was uh, rereading through the, through the uh, Phoenix project. Who's read that? Awesome. So, and a couple things that really stuck out to, me, out to me this time reading through and saying, you know, these are some things that we've seen ourselves in action. Concourse is what's enabled us to get out from behind constant firefighting of platforms and actually get into having now the cycles to create tooling and processes that help automate and help make it easier for operations to continue to manage the platform. And that effect becomes exponential. As you build more automation tooling, you free up more time to build out more automation tooling. It grows and grows and grows. And Concourse has been, that's why Concourse for us has been a game changer. So just taking a look at this in action with the, the smoke test example. You'll see every 15 minutes against every environment, we're running another concourse pipeline to push uh, and run the smoke test Aaron. And if you're, so you're not familiar with the smoke test Aaron, what that's doing is creating an org, creating a space, um, pushing an application, and then checking to make sure that that application is up and running. Really putting the whole cloud controller API, elastic runtime, and the Diego scheduling service through its paces. So a successful smoke test is a pretty good indicator that Elastic Runtime um, for itself, maybe not all the ancillary services, but Elastic Runtime itself is up and running pretty well. So then taking this one step further and combining what we've done with Concourse and combining what we've done with Datadog, the last piece of that is down here at the bottom actually pushing the metrics of success and failure up to Datadog so we can track that over time. So here you see we have a time series over the last week of successful success and failed smoke tests against an environment. We also have alerts set up so that we find out when smoke tests fail so we know as operators when the, if there's an issue with the platform long before a developer opens a, a service ticket or says, hey, something's broke. Concourse has been immensely powerful um, and, and immensely valuable to us uh, by being able to do these things. So along our journey here, we've come a long way. We've changed a lot. What have we learned? Well, first, it's OK to be a donkey farm. We were expecting 12, fact, 12 out of 12 factor unicorns, realized that wasn't the case. But that's OK. Application teams and developers are still getting the benefits of a PaaS while re-architecting their application and continuing to grow their application maturity through refactoring and, and more to a true cloud-native application. And we've been able to do that and help them on that journey by empowering, continuing to empower them with tooling. 
this is something, again, is a, is a continual lesson we have to keep teaching ourselves as an operations team that at the end of the day, our purpose, this platform's purpose, is to empower developers. One of the ways we do that is providing transparency into the platform. Shifting the burden of responsibility of operations and some architecture considerations, the middleware versions, pushing those away from the development team and now into the build pack and into the platform, that's a significant change. To ask a development team who's been doing that for years, who has, that's their scope of ownership, that's their, their value add and say, no, you, you don't control that anymore, we're gonna take care of that for you. And they'll say, ah, I don't really trust you to take care of that for me. That's where you provide that transparency. You still, you wanna give, you take over ownership of operations, but you provide as much transparency to view into those operations to help build up that level of trust between developers and platform operations. And finally, automate everything. If we're, doing, if we're performing an action against an environment, it should be done through automation, because chances are we're gonna have to do it to the other 12. That's been our journey so far. Where are we going? Well, first, taking those alerts and now turning them into meaningful remediation. Really going full circle with this uh, convergence between, or, or interface between uh, concourse and Datadog. Having concourse report on events or findings, push that up to Datadog for tracking, monitoring, and then alerting, and then taking that alert and putting it right back down into concourse for remediation. And it leads into, again, concourse all the things. Our, our major platform investments over these next few months will all be around increasing our automation and management capabilities through concourse. And then we can always do a better job with platform transparency. The next steps for that for us will be to take all those metrics and uh, visibility into those metrics that we use internally from operations and build those out into dashboards available to developers and to executives being able to show with one click or through an API, what's the health of this platform? Should I, should I push to this platform right now? Is it up and available or should I push somewhere else? Being able to provide that data out to developers, continually providing that view into the platform. I'm hoping now as we've gone through just a brief summary of our journey and what we've learned and where we think we're going, that we've provided a little bit of information um, that you'll be able to use and apply to your own platforms. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending here and then now open it up for any questions. Yes? Stability. Um, and it com comes down to, we were finding with OpenStack that our failures were not isolated to availability zones. They weren't isolated to hardware clusters. They were logical failures that affected the entire cloud. So to, to affect, in order to effectively run um, an HA multi-AZ approach with Cloud Foundry, that required two independent foundations for every, um, or running them on separate OpenStack environments entirely within the same data center just to provide some level of HA. And so the level of overhead redundancy on that was, was too great. Yes? Yes, as a So the, so the question is, where does APM fit into all of this? So I showed infrastructure level monitoring um, 
and what, what is used by an operations team for the health of the platform. When it comes to what Verizon has done for APM, as we've uh, come from a history of so many different companies and so many different uh, independent IT organizations that have now, through mergers and acquisitions, become one large, pretty happy family, um, everyone's come with their own opinion and their own existing licensing contracts about what APM they want to use. So we've taken the, the hands-off APM agnostic approach and say, you should use an APM. Um, in some cases, we're saying, out of the box now, you can have PCF metrics available to you, but you're going to still want to bring your own APM here, and we'll help you plug it in. So APM is, be is being still brought in and determined by uh, the different consuming applications. Yes? We, not fully, um, nothing beyond the lab at this point. Um, I think more so it's been not a platform limitation, it's been where .NET applications have been focusing on. Yes? Uh, I have so many questions for us. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll be, I'll be available after as well for any additional questions, or, or, or uh, send them to me on Twitter. Um, so I can give one example, which has been change management. Um, we come historically from ITIL systems with a two-week, you have to sit in a change review board meeting two weeks prior to wanting to make that change, and you have to get all of your stakeholders to agree on, okay, that's a reasonable time to make this change. We have 12 environments with potentially disruptive changes happening during upgrades or during fixes. <clears throat> to get consensus between 100 applications on when a good window for that is and, to, and have that agreed upon with a two-week lead time, not going to happen. So change management is an example where we really, in some cases, had to push and say, this is the way it has to be for this platform to be successful. This is the way, and in, we're fortunate enough with Cloud Foundry being um, such a community focus and consumed outside in the enterprise that we have plenty of examples of other uh, operations teams or other companies and say, this is how they're doing it. There's no reason we can't do it this way, which has led us now to categorization of changes into high, low risk. Um, low risk changes are approved automatically. We use automation to put them in change control. Um, those that are high risk are still done with, they're not done with that two week schedule, but they're still done in the evening. Yes. Um, so the question is, what's our, what's our public cloud strategy? <laughs> um, so we want to move a large number of our IT workloads into public cloud. We think it's an innovation accelerator, and as we continue to grow up our compute needs across all areas of the business, not just IT, we're looking for opportunities to expand that compute without the, inv we're already you know, running at capacity at our data centers. We'd really like to avoid that capital investment of additional data centers. Um, that said, with uh, government contracts um, and lots of you know customer identifying data, um, this uh, you know call detail records, things like that, we'll always have a need, I believe, to keep some of our systems within firewalls. Um, I think the definition of what's allowed to go to public cloud and what has to be in, in inside will continue to change and it'll continue to shift in favor of public cloud as we become more familiar and used to and comfortable with it. But I think there will always still be a few use cases that exist. Um, but I don't think necessarily that's a, it's, it's targeted by use case. It's not a cloud bursting model. Yes? <laughs> so, I mean, the example there of a multi-tenant platform, but um, helping applications troubleshoot issues. So the, the question was, um, with a multi-tenant platform and trying to enable application troubleshooting while still keeping developers happy, those are really, in, in many cases, conflicting ideas. Um, how are we successful with that? So I think... 
multi-tenancy became a requirement just from an operations perspective. We couldn't give every team their own foundation. So in order to go into Cloud Foundry, the, the cost of entry was you're going to have to be able to play nice with others. Um, second, the enabling application troubleshooting and keeping developers happy, I think, go actually go hand in hand. That in keeping developers happy, we want to provide all of that tooling to enable application troubleshooting and make application troubleshooting um, as painless of a process. But I'll be honest with you. That's something that we, are, we have struggled with over the last couple of years. We've made great investments in the platform. Um, I think there's still a lot that we can do um, to invest in enabling application teams, supporting application teams, really providing a, a, a one-stop support endpoint for not just Cloud Foundry, but 12-factor cloud-native applications that run in build packs. Yes? Mm -hmm. sort of, do you have an example of what sort of tooling you put in place uh, to, to showcase that? And, and I guess, I mean, I don't want to say the word prove, but prove mm -hmm. uh, to, to, like, you know, one way or the other. Sure. So one of those it was an, um, an, an app we found out there. I think uh, Pivotal Engineering had, had written it to help troubleshoot, and that was uh, Will It Connect? It's up on GitHub, and that one was a, a just a, a really simple Spring Boot application that you provide... Um, an endpoint, and that application will tell you whether or not it can establish that connection. One of the first things we often have with troubleshooting um, is identifying is there some kind of down de dependency with a back end service so that application wasn't, and that dependency wasn't uh, put through circuit breaker appropriately, so it was failing to stage because the database service wasn't actually responding. A tool like Will It Connect is now, you take their app out of the equation, and you put that dependency into that en into that will it connect field and see if that endpoint is up. Um, right, or and then at that point we also look at and what we're looking to get into um, is building out uh, straw man status applications on the platform. So these are applications that really don't have any external dependencies. They're only dependent on Cloud Foundry. And the help, you can point and look at those apps and continually push and rerun, uh, restage those applications to show. Looks like, we can't say authoritatively, but we can say with some confidence that Cloud Foundry, the platform, is not the issue in this case. So let's go take a look at what's happening within your application. I have so many questions for you. All right. Yes. Yes. So the question is, does Verizon have, are you, are you from Garmin? OK, because Garmin was talking about their labs. Um, we're like, oh, that sounds like our dojos. So um, within the last, um, say, eight months here, since the start of the year, in some of our um, tech environment, in some of our tech heavy office locations, we've established uh, dojo programs, um, a lot around teaching of DevOps principles, um, and just some new kind of modern tools and techniques you can use to accelerate your app development um, and, and put apps, app teams through those engagements, uh, through those for like a four to six week engagement where they're, they're working on still delivering their, uh, their desired outcomes for the application, but they're doing it uh, side by side with coaches trained to teach in, in that, those techniques and tooling. Yes? I think the first one we're going to try and tackle is self-scaling um, around a Diego, we're running low of me on memory alert, we're going to need to add a couple more Diego cells. So taking that, taking that alert up to Datadog so we have that alert, we can see how often that happens and we can see once that alert hits and once that remediation event gets pushed up, the remediation is complete, we should be able to see corresponding in time the alleviation of that memory constraint. Yes. Uh, do you guys have any uh, stateful We have a lot of teams who want us to support stateful services um, or, and stateful applications. I think we're, we're waiting patiently on some additional functionality around the, the NFS volume service, um, support for some more NFS backends and some support for backups before we really open the doors on that and say, hey, bring, bring your stateful apps, we can support those. 
Um, but there's, there's certainly the ask for that. In terms of database, we really try, as you saw the list there um, for the operations team and just the, the scope of ownership and control, if you throw database administrator into that mix, um, we'd be underwater. So we've really, we've drawn a hard line and said, as an operations team, we cannot, we can't also be supporting uh, database services. We'll be happily integrate to another database as a service offering and expose it through the marketplace, but there still needs to be a Verizon uh, database ownership group over that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, con well, anytime there's a problem, they constantly talk to each other. No, and, and, and really, I've, your, your platform team within Verizon, it, the, way, the way the team, way, the way we've organized you know, around Conway's Law, right? Um, the way our processes have, have organized is, as the platform team has been the closest and the closest tied to the success of the platform, they've also become the evangelists of the platform. So they're also the ones kind of out there beating the doors a little bit for, hey, have you tried out Cloud Foundry? That sounds like a use case that would be well suited for Cloud Foundry. Let's see if we can um, help you out and, and teach you some of the ways um, you can have success here. Yes? Um, yes. Um, so we've, we've, usually it's come into, could we find an opportunity to consolidate our APM and our infrastructure monitoring under one system for consolidated pricing? Um, so we looked at New Relic as they moved into the infrastructure space, and then we looked at Datadog's APM tools that came out recently. Um, so I think it's something we're still continually looking at. One of the big drivers for us with Datadog was that um, there is a, a well-established method of getting those firehose metrics out to Datadog. That was provided out of the box with a minimal, we did a little bit of config on it, um, but it didn't take much. Right. Yes? Sure. Um, so that's actually, within the last couple of months, really what I've, I've moved into now is an additional platform. Um, we're looking at an API first re-architecture strategy across our IT landscape. So we're looking for a singular API gateway, an API management platform. Um, so for that, we're, um, we're working with Apigee, now Google Cloud, on that. All right, one more question. Let's see if I've got enough time here. So we're off of, um, so it's, we're off, we're, we're getting everything through Pivotal. So we're on Pivotal Elastic Runtime Release 1.10. Yeah. All right, looks like we're running out of time here. Thank everybody.